You're listening to Medscape's In Discussion series on lung cancer, a podcast where thought leaders and clinical experts share their diverse insights and practical ideas for optimizing patient care. This series is hosted by Dr. Jacob Sands, Assistant Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Physician in the Thoracic Oncology Program at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, Massachusetts, and Oncology Medical Director of the Dana-Farber Brigham International Patient Center. Relevant disclosures can be found with the episode show notes on Medscape.com or on the Medscape app. The topics and discussions are planned, produced, and reviewed independently of advertisers. This podcast is intended only for Yale's healthcare professionals. Hello, I'm Dr. Jacob Sands. Welcome to Season 3 of the Medscape In Discussion Lung Cancer Podcast Series. Today, we'll discuss nut carcinoma. But first, let me introduce my guest, Dr. Jia Luo. Dr. Luo is an instructor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. She's a thoracic medical oncologist at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and her research focuses on developing better treatments, particularly related to genetic and immune characteristics of lung cancers. She leads and develops clinical trials testing anti-cancer medicines that target cancers driven by these changes. As part of that work, she has also developed particular expertise related to nut carcinoma. Dr. Luo, welcome to the Medscape In Discussion Lung Cancer Podcast. Thank you so much for having me on, Dr. Sands. Now, nut carcinoma, I think, is a generally underappreciated diagnosis. This is something that I see sometimes where the initial stains didn't really lead to a nut carcinoma diagnosis, and it has actually taken the medical oncologist recognizing that clinically this could be a nut carcinoma and then directing pathology to go back and evaluate that. So, Related to that complexity, can you just first help us tease apart where we should be considering and specifically thinking about nut carcinoma as a diagnosis? Yeah, absolutely. And I think part of this is we're doing an investigation to really figure out the reason this is being underdiagnosed. And it it turns out the pathologists do actually quite a good job picking this up. But you're absolutely right, Dr. Sands, that sometimes it does take additional clinical intuition from a medical oncologist or another clinician. So to take a step back, nut carcinoma, the reason it's hard to diagnose is that it is ultimately a molecular diagnosis. So what that means is the cancer itself is driven by a BET family member, such as BRD4, BRD3, NSD3, among others, fused to a gene known as NUTM1. So NUTM1 stands for nuclear protein in testis 1, and it's a protein that really should be expressed in only the developing testes and ovaries, so it should not be a protein that is expressed in other parts of the body in, in an adult, such as the lung, as a lung primary or head and neck primary. And what happens is we, we think this is purely bad luck. So I always tell my patients, there's nothing that you did or did not do to have a diagnosis of non-carcinoma. There's likely a random genetic event that caused a double-strand break to happen, both in the nut M1 gene as well as the BET family member. And then these two genes become fused together and ultimately DNA becomes RNA becomes protein. So transcription translation, you end up with this nut M1 BRD fusion that generates this oncoprotein. And what ends up happening is this protein binds to acetylated histones. So you may recall that histones are where uh, DNA is wound into histones and then compressed into chromatin. And you really need to acetylate and, and unwind DNA from histones in order to complete a transcription and translation and gene expression. And so when this oncoprotein binds acetylated histones, it actually recruits another protein that's also an epigenetic reader known as P300. And all three of those proteins come together into a complex that leads to massive uh, histone acetylation and actually forms these megadomains, which are large areas of open DNA that's being translated and transcribed. And then this ultimately leads to upregulation of genes like MYC, SOX2, other oncogenes, and ultimately drives nut carcinoma. So it's tough because it's a fusion oncogene, oncoprotein, 
And it's a molecular diagnosis of very specific fusions that drive this. And so when something is a molecular diagnosis and it's a fusion, it's not generally picked up on your standard NGS panels that we like to send. So I think that that's ultimately one of the reasons. Going to your question, Dr. Sands, about what sort of patient I would think about this in, specifically in the context of lung cancer, I think anyone who is younger, doesn't have much of a smoking history, like 10-pack year or less, and then has a poorly differentiated or squamous histology, you really should discuss with your pathology colleagues, hey, has someone thought about nut carcinoma? So that's very helpful to get that outline to the genomics in particular around the diagnosis. Can you also specify what scans would look like in related to typical nut carcinoma diagnosis that we should really consider in those younger patients as you outline with less of a smoking history and poorly differentiated squamous pathology? What else would we see on scans or, or anything else related to the diagnosis? Great point, Dr. Sands, because you're right that clinically we have to think about this. So I think contrary to popular belief, we're trying to overturn this myth as well, is that the term midline has actually been removed from the name of this cancer. And so we now just call it nut carcinoma. We've dropped the term midline. And it's mostly because initially it was thought that this cancer only developed in the midline, but we're actually seeing that similar to the histology of, of poorly differentiated or squamous being the most common, that we we actually do clinically see it, at least from a lung cancer perspective, like a squamous cell lung cancer. So I would think about getting what you usually get for someone with squamous cell lung cancer, cross-sectional imaging, generally uh, CT, chest, abdomen, pelvis. I would get a PET scan. If there's back pain, I would consider getting an MRI of the total spine. And then I would get a baseline brain MRI as well. So I would actually approach it quite similarly to someone with a new diagnosis of a garden variety squamous cell lung cancer. And we often do see a lung mass. There could be post-obstructive pneumonia. There does tend to be enlarged mediastinal lymph nodes. And then the sites of metastasis, because this is such an aggressive cancer, tend to be where you would see squamous lung cancer. So like bone, liver, lymph nodes, organs like that. Now, you've described already this uh, generally has a poor prognosis. And so this has, I know, has been a challenging diagnosis to treat. And before we dive into some of the initial discussion on that, I just want to give our listeners a look ahead and say that Dr. Luo will be going over some clinical trials options that are currently available that I just want to make sure people are aware are particularly important in this disease setting. And so we'll get to that in a moment. But first, Dr. Luo, can you describe for us what general first-line treatment looks like, particularly in the metastatic setting? Yeah. So when considering first-line treatment, I, I would think about squamous cell lung cancer directed regimens. We did a recent large case series of over 100 patients within what's known as the International Nut Carcinoma Registry. And feel free to visit that website. It's nceregistry.org. But it's individuals who had nut carcinoma and are contributing their patient data anonymously. And so we looked at the primary medical records and looked into what were treatments that they were receiving. And it does seem like, in general, a squamous cell cancer-derived regimen, such as your platinum doublet chemotherapy. And I, I would consider checkpoint inhibitors right now just partly because about a quarter of these individuals are pdl one tumor proportion score positive. And also this is, as Dr. Sands and I were discussing, quite aggressive. And so to be honest, like a fair number of people don't make it to the second line. So I, I would actually consider adding the checkpoint blockade and considering it like you would treat squamous cell lung cancer. One question we had in this particular analysis was that some people have looked into iphosphamide-based treatments, and that's because this cancer also in some ways resembles Ewing sarcoma. There's a younger patient population, and there's some sarcoma features to this cancer. What we have learned from this analysis is that potentially there may be a benefit in a very subset of young, generally pediatric patients, in the non-metastatic setting to really try to cite or reduce before uh, multimodal therapy. But in general, 
we didn't see a significant benefit in ifosfamide based regimens. So I, I would think about squamous lung cancer directed treatment for these individuals. Now, you've mentioned that with ifosfamide seeing benefit potentially in the younger patient subset. Is there data for that in early stage or is there any data for early stage treatment? Great question, Dr. Sands. As you can imagine, this is a pretty aggressive cancer. The most common presentation is in the metastatic setting, especially with a lung primary similar to lung squamous cancers. But there are uh, a select number of individuals who present a little bit earlier. We looked at this with our limited data set, and we only identified a handful of individuals. And so this will obviously need further investigation with larger patient populations. But of individuals that we know who lived for three years or longer, all of them actually presented with non-metastatic disease, so disease that hadn't spread beyond the thorax or the head and neck. And they all had surgery. They also, for the most part, had radiation therapy around the time of surgery as well. And all of them received perioperative systemic therapy. Within this group, there were a few individuals who had ifosfamide-based therapy, but they were all younger than age 15. So I think this generally speaks to that there could be a subset of individuals, probably pediatric patients, who would benefit from ifosfamide-based treatment. But as a population overall in nut carcinoma, especially us adult medical oncologists, I, I would actually consider a more traditional squamous-driven regimen. And I think the the big take-home here as well in this non-metastatic patient setting is really engaging your colleagues in thoracic surgery and radiation oncology, considering referral to a major academic center that performs a lot of these lung surgeries, and having that multidisciplinary discussion for these patients. I think it is critical to maximize our ability to eradicate the cancer early on. That's interesting. And with a pediatric population, I would assume that those are generally going to end up at the larger centers with more specialized surgeons for those kinds of cases where you mentioned the, the handful of individuals that had more than three years survival. Are there any older patients in that data set that had more than three years survival? When I say older, I'm talking even in the 40s, which I know for this diagnosis is, is a bit older, what is the age range that you're seeing some of the benefits of, of those durable disease control cases? So once again, this is limited by not a large data set. We are trying to more consistently have individual consent to the registry and increase our numbers. But in the limited number of individuals, we saw the, the age range of the three-year or longer survivors were ages 13, but went up to the 60s. The median age of nut carcinoma, we think, is in the 20s to 30s, based on internal data of all the patients we've ever seen with nut carcinoma. But they actually range from less than one years old to uh, the oldest patient we have in the registry is 82 years old. So even though we think of it more in the young patient population, I would say that you can be any age. And, and within that this report also looked at gender as well as self-reported race and ethnicity, and it's in both genders. It's across uh, races and ethnicities. So you really have to think about it in all individuals presenting with thoracic primary looking cancer that's largely poorly differentiated or squamous. I would really think about this, this cancer diagnosis. Well, this really highlights the importance of this registry in that much of our knowledge about these cases and what's working and what's not really comes at this point largely, not entirely, but largely from this registry. So you said that was ncregistry.org? Yeah, exactly. Or if you Google nut carcinoma registry, it should be the first hit. Okay, this is great. So all of our listeners, we can all contribute, hopefully, and really make sure that as we see cases, they end up in this registry so that our discussion can be more plentiful in the years ahead as we go. But part of that actually is also going to be advancing treatment options. Now, before we get into some of the clinical trials that I know you're, you're involved with, what about back in line and beyond treatment? Is that also something that we think of more as traditional squamous cell treatments? Or is there anything different as we get into second line and beyond when talking about treating nut carcinoma? 
Great question, Dr. Sands. And I, I wish I had a good answer for that. And I, I think it just speaks to the aggressiveness of this cancer that we really don't. For instance, one question that we're actively trying to address is who are the patients who benefit from immunotherapy-based treatments? And not based on a lot of data, I would think that squamous regimens would help these patients. But I, I would say in the second line, and even in the first line, to really think about considering a clinical trial. Uh, I know most listeners here are based in the U.S. We have several clinical trials that we'll dive right into, but I, I'm also aware of clinical trials in, in Europe. And the other thing that I would actually bring up, not just treatment derived at shrinking the cancer, like chemotherapy or targeted therapy, like trials or treatments, but getting early palliative care involved in these individuals is actually extremely important. And um, I'm not talking about palliative care from like a hospice perspective, but most patients present with metastatic disease. They can have bone metastasis. It's a common site of spread. And so really thinking about engaging your palliative care colleagues is actually quite important. Um, and thinking about palliative radiation as well to, to sites that you know are painful. And because there is a bias towards young adult patient populations, if there is social work or other supportive care within your institution, such as a young adult program, thinking about things like fertility preservation, those are all something that we don't traditionally think about in lung cancer, but we actually should think about in this patient population. And I will say the other thing is, Dr. Sands and I were discussing that the prognosis is not great. And so I do think an early conversation, at least mentioning to the patient, like, what do you know about the prognosis of this cancer, I do think is important, um, especially for this cancer, as almost this is a routine informed consent discussion, because I, I do think that it is super important to be upfront about this. These are some very important points that you're bringing up in the complexities of caring for particularly younger patients. And for our listeners, I'll direct you back to a conversation I had with Dr. Rosenstein around interacting with patients. That's more broad in oncology care, but I think some of the things he brought up in that discussion are really going to be of particular interest when dealing with this population of patients as well. And Dr. Luo is also mentioning something he had said and saying, starting with their understanding of things and really diving a bit more into how best to interact with these patients, considering that this is going to have some unique challenges in younger patients relative to, of course, some of our older patients that are also challenging, but, but unique in both. And this is all in our effort to provide individual care to each patient that we're treating. This is a, a tough setting, though. I mean, you're talking about younger patients, poor prognosis. We've said first-line therapy being a squamous treatment. Often you, you highly recommend giving with checkpoint inhibitor recognizing that a decent percentage of patients are not ever going to get the second line therapy. When talking about second line and beyond, it sounds like the data we have is somewhat limited. We know prognosis is poor. You, you mentioned earlier that the majority of patients don't live three years from the registry data. So now this gets into clinical trials sound overwhelmingly important in this setting. Give us some good news. What what are you seeing as far as trials? What are some of the ones you'd like to highlight? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think early consideration of clinical trials for this cancer is absolutely necessary because there are limited treatments and there's no FDA-approved treatment. What I think is potentially a large vulnerability of this cancer is ultimately it is largely an oncogene-driven form of non-small cell lung cancer. And we've seen successes before over and over again in oncogene-driven non-small cell lung cancer. So I, I do think that focusing on that does hold some promise in this cancer. And we currently have four clinical trials that are available. The, the history of this is there are these medicines called BET bromo domain inhibitors, and they are a therapeutic vulnerability in this cancer. These drugs are oral. They're small molecules that ultimately internalize into cancer cells and competitively inhibit and evict these BET proteins, including not oncoprotein. The first generation of these drugs, one, they were rather 
nonspecific for but family members. And then two, they were limited by toxicity. And we, we had some responses. It was the monotherapy objective response rate is around a quarter. And most individuals did not have a prolonged duration of response. And so all of the trials that we have available now are really trying to be combination studies that are potentially more tolerable. We actually do have a first-line trial. It's CTEP ETCTN10507. It's a combination of chemotherapy, in this case, cisplatin and etoposide, with a bet bromo domain inhibitor Zen 3694. And then we have several second-line studies. These can all be found on clinicaltrials.gov as active and rolling. But the three that are in the metastatic setting include CTEP ETCTN10509, which is a bet bromo domain inhibitor uh, Zen 3694 plus abemacyclib, which is a CDK46 inhibitor. This is derived from preclinical data out of our institution in Stephen Illich's lab, noting that CDK46 inhibition is synthetically lethal with bet bromo domain inhibition. We also at our institution have the Kronos Bio CDK9 inhibitor study open. That's also an oral therapy in the second line or metastatic setting that's inhibiting CDK9, which is not a cell cycle CDK, but one that regulates epigenetic machinery associated with BRD4 nut. And that is enrolling patients. And then finally, there is a dual BAT P300 inhibitor from epigenetics that's also enrolling. And I should mention that all of these trials are enrolling at, at multiple sites across the United States. So patients don't have to necessarily relocate to Boston. They're open in Houston, Texas as well with Dr. Serena Pihapal. The ETCTN trials are open with Dr. Robert Sue at University of Southern California. And then these other industry-sponsored trials are also open at, at other sites as well. So I would absolutely consider these trials and then within our pediatric patient population, we also have a BET Roma domain inhibitor trial open with Steve Dubois here with our pediatrics group. Well, in many ways, it feels like we're just starting the discussion, but that's all the time we have for today. I look forward to advances in the field. Today, we talked with Dr. Luo about nut carcinoma, and I'm going to outline some of that discussion. First of all, she highlighted that this is a molecular diagnosis, and it really comes from fusion, which makes it a little tougher to diagnose in NGS panels. Those panels better pick up mutations and fusions are a little bit tougher. That the population of patients that get nut carcinoma are generally younger with a lower or no smoking history. And on pathology, the first look at it typically looks like a poorly differentiated squamous cell lung cancer. Although this used to be called midline, Dr. Little highlighted that midline is no longer a part of the diagnosis and that this really is not limited to a central location. Although if there's a lung mass, then there's often mediastinal lymph nodes, and there can be bulky disease within the mediastinum. That part of initial workup should be really much like squamous cell carcinoma with a brain MRI and CT chest, abdomen, pelvis. The treatment in the first line setting as far as standard of care is broadly the squamous cell treatments with chemotherapy plus a checkpoint inhibitor. About 25% of patients do have pdl one positive disease, hence the importance of using checkpoint inhibitor. Dr. Lillo highlighted that there's a substantial number of patients that don't make it to second-line therapy, and so that first-line treatment is important. Much of this discussion really about data comes from ncregistry.org being a collection of cases that have been submitted. And to all of our listeners, if you have patients with nut carcinoma, really urge you to go to that site and contribute this patient data. This is how we're able to really talk about the diagnosis and come up with better treatments. Dr. Liu highlighted that from that data, we really see some iphosphamide use, but usually when there are benefits with that, it's in particularly young patients. And that broadly across the population, iphosphamide does not actually show particularly promising results. But there may be a subset of patients there, particularly in the younger subset. There is some early stage disease reported in there and outcomes, although again, a limited number of cases. Those that have lived at least three years are broadly limited stage and have had typically surgery, radiation, and perioperative systemic therapy as well. In the second line setting, there's really very limited data. And although Dr. Liu highlighted that 
other squamous regimens are, are probably the ones to choose outside of clinical trials, there really are some important clinical trials to discuss. She highlighted in optimism that this is a largely oncogene-driven non-small cell lung cancer, and we've seen some great success in our treatment in oncogene-driven cancers, particularly over the last little bit more than a decade now. We've highlighted that in other sessions through our series on lung cancer treatments. There are a lot of oncogene-driven cancers that we've discussed and an array of treatments, and hopefully this is a diagnosis where we'll have some of that success to report out further in future discussions. The bet-bromine inhibitors are oral regimens and really right now some of the most promising. Dr. Liu highlighted a first-line trial of cisatoposide and the bet bromo inhibitor Zen 3694. There are also second line and beyond trials with a bemacyclib and Zen 3694, a CDK9 inhibitor that is also an oral drug, and then a combination, a dual bet and CBP P300 inhibitor. So although this is a particularly challenging diagnosis with a poor prognosis, in what is generally a young population, there are some regimens that are showing some promise and there are some clinical trials options available. And so I would just like to underscore a few things from the discussion, again, in saying that ncregistry.org has a site to contribute data, but also in recognizing that there are important clinical trials to consider for each patient that uh, is uh, being treated for this diagnosis. Uh, I'd also like to highlight, please take a moment to download the Medscape app to listen and subscribe to this podcast series on lung cancer. This is Dr. Jacob Sands for the Medscape In Discussion Lung Cancer Podcast. Thanks for listening to Medscape's In Discussion Lung Cancer Podcast series with our host, Dr. Jacob Sands. Be sure to look for more In Discussion episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Check out Medscape.com or the Medscape app for show notes, links, and more information on lung cancer.